Who hasn't heard Tom Baker speak? Anybody here for the first time? Haven't heard him? Oh, this is uh, this is wonderful. Tom Baker is our most, I think, beloved speaker. He's great. He's always got a story to go with it that he takes on himself, so he goes in a humble way and then he brings it back up. And it's always humorous. It's always fun and it's always light and bright. I look at Tom and he's such a great person. He's so full of joy and fun and, uh, and seriousness too. Because he has some deep things to share with us. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Come on up. <laughs> Well, I didn't know what I was going to say this Sunday, and then I read the newsletter, which introduced me essentially as a marriage counselor. <laughs> I am a marriage counselor, as well as doing other types of therapy, uh, and uh, it even gave the phone number that you could call uh, if you needed marriage counseling. So, if, oh, you went to my website. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I got the idea. Well, I'll just talk about marriage. Now, this is a kind of reflection on marriage. Uh, what makes it work? What doesn't make it work? Uh, why, it, why it comes together? Sometimes why it falls apart? Edgar Casey said something very interesting about marriage. He said, marriage is the hothouse of forgiveness. That's something, it's the hot house of forgiveness. It's where you can't quite run away from yourself because she'll stand in your way. Or he'll stand in your way. It goes both ways, and it goes both ways pretty equally. Um, except that women usually understand more about marriage than men do. Why? Are they special? Are they amazing? Of course they're special and amazing. But the reason really is because they've been thinking about getting married since they were about five years old. <laughs> Men don't start thinking about it until puberty. And then they don't think well about it. <laughs> they're not happy about getting married. It's the ball and chain and all that kind of thing. People say it is. But I, uh, I had a, a, a while in my life in which I was celibate. I had 16 years in which I was a celibate priest. Well, I was a celibate seminarian, then I was a celibate priest. So 16 years I had to sort of think about the woman that if I ever left the priesthood, which I did, or if they ever stopped celibacy, which they didn't, I would um, I'd marry. It was, it was a, a common fantasy of mine. So I would, uh, I would put it this way, as far as what I thought about it. It, it's a, it was a little longer list than I have here, but we don't have time to think of every woman that I would have liked to have married. <laughs> it was weird. Uh, but a woman as holy as Mother Teresa, and as wild as Jane Fonda in her role as Barbarella. Remember Barbarella? Yeah, she was, yeah. As spontaneous and cute as Sally Field and the Flying Nun, and as reserved and long-suffering as the little flower of Therese, little, the, Teresa, the little flower of Lousseau. As beautiful as Mary Tyler Moore, may she rest in peace, as poetic as Emily Dickinson, and as courageous as Amelia Earhart. A woman who would be every woman I ever admired, and a woman, and, and I thought about this a lot, a woman who would not criticize me. The last quality <laughs> The non-critical woman is what I got. Aha. Uh -huh. 
that there was a problem. Whenever two people come together, there's always a problem. The problem was, I wanted to chat, and Kathy was happy to contemplate. She was so quiet. I wanted to talk about everything. I'm gregarious. Yet, this gregarious guy, that was me, who loved to talk, almost became a Trappist monk. They don't talk. <laughs> Not only did I take a vow of celibacy, I almost took a vow of silence. Can you imagine that? Today, I don't do much talking in my work, except at very crucial moments. I'm a professional listener. I'm a counselor. If you come in for marriage counseling, I will be listening to you mostly. I won't be telling you how to be married like the person you're married to who's telling you how to be married. <laughs> so there's a very quiet side of me that connects with my wife, Kathy. And we both understand. So that when we're not talking, there's a very comfortable silence. Not between us, but a silence we dwell within like snuggling and reading with the snow falling outside the window. Isn't that nice? Yeah. It can be rain falling. It can be the sun shining outside the window. It doesn't make any difference. Now, I feel love from people when people tell me encouraging and supportive things. Like when Robert said, we all love Tom. Oh, that was a moment. It really was. I love that. But I don't feel love so much when people do things for me. When we first got married, Kathy would clean the house. She would cook these beautiful meals. She would make everything around the house perfect. It was neat, it was clean, it was orderly. And I thought that Kathy just liked to do those things. <laughs> I said, you know, it's really great that you love to clean the house. And these meals, you know, man, you're, a, you're like a chef. It's amazing. I'm glad you like what you do. And she said, I don't like any of this. I love you. I'm doing it for you, you idiot. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So she had, she had a different love language than me. I, I love supportive, encouraging uh, words and that kind of thing. And she learned to do that too. She, she learned my love language and I've learned her lo love language. I now empty the dishwasher. Huh? How about that? I'll be doing, I'll, I'll be taking out the garbage soon. <laughs> also, before I do something hard, like speaking, this is hard to do for me, um, she always tells me that I'll, I'll do great. Uh, with a few reservations, Kathy uh, admires me. A few reservations, but not many. I'm bright, I tell a good story, and I'm kind. Kathy is bright, she lives a good story. And she's kind, but I reserve the right to criticize a little bit. She's impatient. In other words, I need to be kind to right like that. Quick. 
But one of the things she does the best, and this is really great, she's not afraid to say when she's afraid. Let me say that again. She's not afraid to say when she's afraid. Most of the time, human beings immediately turn fear into anger. I'm scared of going broke. That's the fear. What are you spending so much money for? That's the anger. If I would say I'm scared of going broke first, instead of just thinking it, or maybe not even thinking it, just thinking it's all her fault, then things would change. Kathy has this little saying, and she says, worry, worry, fret, fret. She's like a little animal from the wind in the willows. <laughs> worry, worry, fret, fret. And that means that she's scared. She worries and worries and frets and frets. And then I know that, and we don't have a fight. If in the middle of a fight, you could say, I'm afraid. I'm afraid you're going to abandon me. I'm afraid you're going to leave me. I'm afraid you don't love me. I'm afraid we're going broke. I'm afraid. Rather than, why did you do that? See the difference? It's a whole big, it's, it's changed my life. My wife is not angry, she's afraid. Not all the time, but sometimes. Now, the greatest temptation in a marriage, I've discovered, is making your partner a scapegoat. You ever lose your keys? <laughs> When I lose my keys, Jerry put his hand in his pocket right there. <laughs> Maybe I lost him. Uh, when I lose my keys, I immediately say, Kathy, where did you put my keys? <laughs> As if she had some kind of mental illness where she hunts for people's keys. And then she takes them and she hoards them in her closet or puts them in a drawer. So that one day I would, I would be looking around in her room and, and I, would, I would discover all these keys somewhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> Somebody's remembering <laughs> in a big way. Now that's how we, that's how we use the other person as a scapegoat. Now, this is what the ego does in marriage. It feels guilty, so then it tries to make the other person guiltier than you are. So that's where the finger pointing comes from. If, if you both are equally innocent, then there will be no fights. There'll be disagreements. There'll be times in which you're, you're not on the same page with each other, but nobody's blamed. Nobody's the bad one or the wrong one. Nobody is on trial. When I do marriage counseling, often people come in and they say, Okay, now it's my turn to talk. So they talk and talk and talk and talk, and then they look at me and say, yeah? And I say, well, let's hear the other person. The other person talks and talks and talks and talks, and they look at me and they say, yeah? And I look at both of them and say, no. <laughs> neither of you is right and neither of you is wrong. You're both expressing your point of view your perspective, and you want the other one to be like you. Marriage is where I learned that all judgment or most judgment is narcissistic. Be like me and I'll love you. Do like me 
and I'll love you. We each have what I call the narcissistic standard. It comes up when you drive. It's very obvious when you're driving. You want everybody to drive like you. If you're a slow driver, you want people to drive slowly, and you think they should. Why are everybody speeding around here? Well, you know, they've got these big cars, they have to do something with them. <laughs> or if you're a fast driver, you always have somebody in front of you. It's never going fast enough. And you say, why aren't they going faster? You're supposed to. You're supposed to break the speed limit or something like that. <laughs> say something irrational like that. <laughs> So in order, in order to love, we have to forgive. Forgiveness is the key to opening the door to love. And what we are, what we are forgiving people for is not being like ourselves. I have to forgive all of you for not being Tom Baker. <laughs> Thank you. And I was just going to say, you have to forgive me. Francis has to forgive me for not being Francis. Robert has to forgive me for not being Robert. He did. Did you hear his words? They were, they, were, they were forgiving words. They were saying, Tom, it's all right. Unless I let go of my insistence that you be like me, think like me, and feel like me, I will feel attraction for you, but I will not feel deep love. You know the phrase, I love you, but I'm not in love with you? Mm -hmm. I hear that phrase every day. I love you, da -da, but I'm not in love with you. In love with you, bubba. <laughs> the attraction has cooled. But there's only a kind of theoretical love that's left. With that, a lack with a lack of forgiveness, then criticism is everywhere. Now the weed in marriage is criticism, especially the criticism of the person. As I said, Kathy does not criticize me and never has. She never takes issue with the core person I am. I tend towards extravagance and generosity. You ever hear the phrase, get some boundaries? <laughs> I have to get some boundaries. I have a kind of Santa Claus complex. You ever hear the phrase, uh, the car dealers say, I'd give them away, but my wife won't let me? <laughs> That's kind of me. I think I'm loved more if I give you stuff. Yeah. I have, I, I have reverse greediness. And it's not generosity, it's compulsion. So if you ask me for a loan, I'm liable to give it to you if my wife isn't near. <laughs> In the early days of our marriage, I was critical of almost everything about Kathy. I was under the delusion, and this is a delusion, that if you criticize someone, they change to what you want them to be. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting thing? Now, there was no evidence that this worked, but I kept doing it. I'd say, um, you need to wear makeup. Kathy doesn't wear makeup. She doesn't wear high heels. She didn't read scholarly books like I read. She loved Hallmark greeting cards Ooh. and hanging out at Hallmark stores. <laughs> Those stores. I, I, I get coughing fits in Hallmark stores because of the candles, you know, those, those candles. Oh, yeah, rum flavored donut candle and all that. Mm. 
And she wouldn't hang pictures on the walls because she didn't want to make any holes in the wall. She had plastic seat covers on her car seats to preserve them. In the snow, she drove too fast. She was from Connecticut and knew how to do that. In traffic, she was too cautious and she never likes me to drive her car because I adjust the seats. <laughs> And I touch things. For anyone who doesn't know, that lady is not Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, see, I would never do those things. I would never be caught dead by myself in a Hallmark store. Just not right. Wow. She also did not want me eating off of her plate. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Until I got married, I had never heard of boundaries. Men don't do boundaries. We just sort of bark at each other and we stand off, you know? <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> You'll see today, and if you watch the Super Bowl, none of those guys have boundaries. You know, they're after each other all the time, knocking each other down, knocking each other out. It's, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. But we'll all watch. And we'll go, oh, oh, oh. Hmm. But in my family, I had a real little family. It was my dad, my mom, my sister, and myself. And we would eat, each, eat off of each other's plates. It was kind of like eating Chinese every meal that we ate, you know, everybody sampling each other's food. <laughs> My family would all eat one apple. Eat one apple and give it to the other and eat the apple. And they'll eat the apple. That's sharing. Yeah. Imagine that. Well, she would always answer my criticisms with a phrase. And the phrase was, you forgot that you love me. Yeah. Now that took a lot of confidence to say that. Now I had dated before, and if I would criticize a person, they would say, you must not love me. Maybe you don't want me. I think I'll take off. Things like that. But she just said, oh, Tom, you forgot. <laughs> you forgot. I know. I, I, I give you the benefit of the doubt. You've forgotten that you love me. And that disarmed me every single time. I said, well, you know, you're right. I've also forgotten where I put my keys. <laughs> it brought me back to the person that I really married. Now, all couples face a crisis in their relationship. And the crisis is that you have to recognize the person you married rather than the dream that you marry. We all have a dream person. And that dream person is what we carry into the marriage. We say to the person that we're going to marry, sometimes we say to them, you are my dream come true. I've been dreaming and dreaming and dreaming and now you've appeared. As if the other person created you. Dream, dream, dream. Now, at some point, the dream falls apart. Maybe it's the first time she passes gas. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's remembering. It's so funny. Everybody goes, yeah, that was it. Uh -huh. The first time you smelled her morning breath or his morning breath. Uh, and, a, and a million other things that come about when it's the person. Now, if you think about judgment, okay, 
Judgment knows for sure. You know this about that person. You know this or that about that person. You're positive. What, what is the antidote for criticism? At first, yes. Yes. If you go drill deep down, what you find, the antidote to criticism is curiosity. What? Curiosity. The heart of love is curiosity. When you say something, instead of saying, oh yeah, you're always saying that. I've heard that a million times before. You say, now where did that come from? What, what about that, uh, that bully in the ninth grade or that sweetheart in the tenth grade or your soul's purpose of the environment or your mom or your dad or how you were brought up, your genetics, your eighth grade teacher, what about all of that? Oh, because what anybody says has an extraordinary history behind it. What anybody does has an extraordinary history behind it. When you're interested in that history, when you're interested in those details about the person, then they're a person again. They're not just what you want. They blossom, they bloom, they're amazed. Just think a minute. The times you felt loved. It wasn't a time where people were talking at you. It was a time where someone was listening. They weren't drumming their fingers on the table. They weren't looking out the window. They weren't checking their cell phone. They were listening to you. If I have curiosity about someone, then I'm beginning to let them know that I love them. Curiosity is the heart of love. Alan Steele used to say that I left the Catholic Church and I married the Holy Spirit. <coughs> The Holy Spirit is not only the third person of the Trinity, it's the third person in my marriage. When my wife and I are at a roadblock, we stop and we pray to the Spirit of love to show us a way through. We assume that when we're mad, we're stupid. When you're mad, you're stupid. You're not bright and brilliant. You're stupid. You have to begin to take a deep breath and say there's some other way. There's a way through that I don't know about, that we don't know about. It's not my way and it's not your way. It's the way. And it always works out. Recently, I got mad at my wife. I said, we don't spend enough time together. We're both too busy. And it's your fault. She said, Tom, remember that I love you. <coughs> and what does love say to us about this? It said that every moment spent with presence is eternal. If you have just three moments together, you have an eternity together. Amen. Oh,
Thank you.